virtual field trip of Jefferson Lab. Uh, today we're going to be showing you briefly how experiments are run here at the lab. My name is Joanna. And I'm Steve. And joining us today we have James Hill House High School in New Haven, Connecticut. Oops, wrong school, sorry. There you are. Hi and welcome. And we also have the Governor's School of Southside, Virginia, located in Keysville, Virginia. Hi and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Morning, guys. I'd also briefly like to introduce our speakers. Uh, we have Mike Epp, who is the Federal uh, Project Director of the 12 GEV CBAF Upgrade. Good morning. And we have David Lawrence, who is a staff physicist located in Hall D, our newest experimental hall. Hi. Hi, Dave. And then we have Sandy Philpott, who is the operating manager for scientific computing. All right. Now, before we begin, I would like to encourage you all to ask questions. We're going to have a question and answer time after each speaker, and then once again at the very end. And for those of you who are joining us, uh, who are watching us live, you can also post questions to our Google Plus events page or our YouTube page. So the uh, first question we need to answer today is, what is Jefferson Lab? Now, if you are familiar with our YouTube page, you may think Jefferson Lab is a place where Joanna and I take liquid nitrogen and throw it around freeze things. And while it would be interesting if there were a lab that were dedicated to that sort of purpose, uh, that's not what Jefferson Lab is all about. What Jefferson Lab is, is a Department of Energy basic physics research facility. And it's our job to study particles called quarks and gluons, which are inside of atoms. Um, that's actually not quite true. Quarks and gluons actually get together and make other particles. The ones you're probably most familiar with are protons and neutrons. Um, so since the scale, a proton, if it were the size of my fist, the atom would be a couple miles across. Uh, the quarks within the protons and neutrons, if you make them the size of your fist, the atom would then need to be about the size of the Earth. And that's what we study here at our lab. Now, of course, these things are too small to see with your eye. And traditionally, you would think, OK, small thing. I want to use a microscope or magnifying glass. Uh, that's not what we use here. To, uh, at our lab, we use a machine called an accelerator to study the quarks within the protons and neutrons. Mm -hmm. And in our accelerator is Mike. And he's going to tell us all about the accelerator. Take it away, Mike. Thanks, Steve and Joanna. My name is Mike Epps. Uh, we don't have good audio on you, Mike. There. Here we go. Thanks. My name is Mike Epps, and I'm a physicist with the U.S. Department of Energy. I'm currently the federal project director for our 12 GEV CBAF upgrade. Before coming to DOE, I worked for about 12 years in the accelerator operations department here at Jefferson Lab. I'm currently standing about 25 feet underground in the main accelerator tunnel for our CBAF machine. CBAF stands for Continuous Electron Beam Accelerator Facility. It's a particle accelerator where we use electrons and accelerate them into fixed targets in one of several nuclear physics end stations. So before we talk about that with one of our later speakers, let's talk about how this accelerator works. Since electrons are negatively charged, they would interact with molecules in the air. So as you can see, we have multiple beam lines here where the electron beam travels. We can recirculate beam up to five times with the lower energy beam being in the top and the higher in the lower passes and send them into one of four experimental end stations. You'll also see large blue and smaller red structures on the beam line. These are magnets because electrons tend to be, they are negatively charged, so they would tend to repel each other. We keep them uh, controlled by using dipoles and or quadrupoles to steer and focus the beam the same way you would use lenses and mirrors to steer and focus a beam of light. We're in an active work zone, so we're going to allow some of our workers to pass. <laughs> okay. uh, as was mentioned earlier, the accelerator is racetrack shaped, which means we can send the beam around up to five and a half times, coming out of our 180 degree arcs. If we can pan down into the straight section, this is where we actually do all of our beam acceleration. It's called a LINAC, which is linear accelerator. And in the straight portions on either side of our racetrack, 
we have the structures that we accelerate beam with. They are five or seven cell accelerating cavities. We keep them in a large thermos bottle type apparatus that's referred to as a cryomodule. They have the property of being superconducting, which allows them to lose all resistance at super low temperatures. So our nominal operating temperature here at Seabath is about two degrees above absolute zero. Using these structures, we have over 330 accelerating cavities. We can increase beam energy using electric fields up to 12 billion electron volts. CBAF is unique because this is the first large-scale uh, application of SRF, or superconducting radio frequency technology, in the world. At this point, if there are questions from the field, I'd be happy to field them. Okay, we do have one question. Uh, we're wondering why we have more than one level of magnet behind you. I'm sorry, Steve. You said, why do we have more than one? Yes, why are there separate size magnets uh, on the arcs? So the electron beam, as the energy increases, you need more and more magnetic field to bend and steer and focus. So you'll see that on the higher beam passes, where the energy is lower, we have smaller magnets because we need a smaller field. As you come down, you need larger and more magnets because the energy of the electron is higher. Great. And the Governor's School has a question as well. So Governor's School, don't forget to take yourself off mute. Hey, so you talked about you could run the electron beam um, on average like five times around the track. What limits the number of times you can run the electron beam around the track? You say how many times? Well, what limits? Not, yeah. Okay, so this is a, a unlike a, a, a storage ring where you have countless times that you go around and you peel off chunks of electrons as you need them. This is a continuous beam. So once we go five and a half times around, we take the remaining electrons and they're sent into a, a beam dump for storage purposes. So this is not a uh, continuous storage ring, but a recirculating LINAC. And since every time you go around, you take up more energy, you That's need correct. different size magnets, so you need additional arcs for every trip around. Until we get to our maximum energy at five and a half of 12 billion electron volts. Uh, we also have another question. Uh, you said that the nominal temperature is about 2 Kelvin. Um, what makes it that cold? So we use liquid helium here to maintain our cryogenic temperatures. At any point, we have more liquid helium on site than anywhere else in, on the planet. Cool. And you also said you're underground. Uh, why is that? Underground gives us natural shielding from the uh, earth above us. We also have a tunnel made out of concrete. It's about 13 feet across, 10 feet high, and our walls are about 2 feet thick. Cool. Do we have any other questions from the schools? And if not... Um, All right. So that has been a look at our accelerator. And um, as Steve and Mike have mentioned, um, it's a tool which scientists use. But the actual experiments take place in our experimental halls. So now we're going to head over to Dave, who is in Hall D, one of our four experimental halls, to tell us more about that. Here's to you, Dave. Uh, Dave, you're on mute. OK, now can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK, thanks, Joanna. So yeah, I'm over here in Hall D. It's the newest experimental hall. And uh, this is the one where we are building an experiment to uh, look for exotic hybrid mesons. And I'll tell you what they are in just a second. But as Mike said, the accelerator's job is to produce this high energy electron beam. And then they send it into the experimental hall. And we use that to do experiments. In this particular hall, we first create a secondary beam of um, high energy photons. Photons are just particles of light. And that's what we use for the experiments in Hall D. The photons are going to come from very close to the, uh, the viewpoint that you're seeing right now from the camera. It's actually set up right near the beam line. There's no beam on now. No beam has come into Hall D yet. Um, but it will come down in this direction and go into the center of that big red thing behind me. And if you can see that, that's a huge superconducting solenoidal magnet. So it's also kept at very low, uh, cool temperatures in order to be superconducting so we can run lots of current through it and create a very intense magnetic field. So we use that magnetic field because uh, when the photons go in, we shoot them into a liquid hydrogen target. Hydrogen has a single proton as its nucleus. And so the reaction that we actually are looking at is a high energy photon interacting with a single proton. And it will do a lot of different things, but um, there's a spray of particles that will come out that get created. And we want to look at the properties of those particles. 
some of the particles that get created, we believe, will be of this um, form, the exotic hybrid mesons. And uh, without going into a lot of detail, um, if you know that, as Steve mentioned, protons and neutrons have three quarks in them, uh, you can also make simpler structures, which are two quark structures, actually a quark and an antiquark, called mesons. And it's possible, we believe, and um, we have uh, theory to back this up, that uh, you can create this in such a way that the, the glue that holds together these quarks can be excited. It can be excited in a way, and the best way to visualize it is like a jump rope spinning around. And that glue then starts to contribute, because it's carrying some energy, um, it starts to contribute to the properties of that particle. Okay, and so this is a kind of a different state of matter, has not really been seen, but if we see this and start mapping out the property and the spectrum of these particles, it tells us something about that glue that holds these together. And that's what's uh, really fascinating for us, because that is the same glue that's holding together protons and neutrons, and therefore most of the matter in the universe is being held together by this um, strong force. Okay, so once we create one of these things, it actually does not live very long. It only lives about 10 to the minus 20th seconds. And then it decays into some other particles, which also live a very short time, and they decay. And after a couple of uh, generations of this, you end up with, you know, four, five, six particles in your final state. And we have detectors surrounding this target that will see these things come flying out. The magnetic field is used because the charged particles will, just as they do in the accelerator, will curve or bend inside of that magnetic field. And we can measure where that along the trajectory of that particle and see um, how far it's, what the curvature of that is, and that tells you what the momentum of the particle is. We also have other detectors. Right now, we haven't got them all installed. There's only one installed inside the magnet. But if you see that black ring in the middle of the big red uh, magnet, that's the first detector installed inside the magnet, and that's a calorimeter. And its job is to actually um, measure the energy of photons. Photons are not bent in the magnetic field. And once they interact, they kind of shower into many different particles and, and eventually get absorbed. And we have detectors that are very sensitive to, um, to those amounts of energy that we can read out. Okay, so once the, uh, the detectors that are in there, we have um, many more that will actually fill that entire space inside there and some downstream that you can't see from here. Once um, we have read out the event into our electronics, we have a high-speed trigger. It's uh, actually the electronics that will decide whether or not we want to record the event, if it's interesting. When we're running at high luminosity, we are going to be um, having interactions at about 400,000 times a second. And our high-speed trigger is going to cut away about half of those so that we only have about uh, 200,000 events per second that we will read out into lots of um, electronics. And they'll be stored in racks like if you can see these black racks behind me. They don't have the electronics in them yet. But they will have uh, racks, several sets of racks like this throughout the hall that will have uh, digitizing electronics that will be able to take very small digital or very small electronic signals, make numbers out of them that then we can send over a network and store on a computer somewhere. When we're running at high speed on high luminosity, we will be reading about three gigabytes a second off of our front end. And we will send that upstairs to a small computer farm that will then make a quick decision and throw away about 90% of those events and keep the 10% that we think actually have something in it. And so we'll be writing about 300 megabytes a second to a disk there. And eventually, then, we will copy that through some fiber optic over to the computer center where they will help take care of it um, for us until we get to the point of analysis on it. So um, the whole thing takes, uh, you know, uh, as far as the experiment, how long it takes to do this, um, the original discussions on this experiment, the GLUEX experiment, um, was, were done in like 1998. I think they had their first meeting. And so we're not actually going to be taking data till next year. So this is one of the longer term type experiments because it's large. It requires not just building this hall. I mean, it's a facility upgrade. We have to upgrade the energy of the accelerator, build a new experimental hall, outfit it with detectors. Um, a typical experiment that might come in that uses existing equipment and the existing accelerator will still take five to six years to actually propose, uh, put together, go on the floor, and then analyze the data and finally punish, publish a result. Hopefully not punish the result, but publish the result. So um, that's about uh, the gist of what I have to say. All right. We actually have a, qu a question from our Google Plus um, event page. Um, what do the research results indicate so far, and how do experiments help us understand our world? And uh, we do understand that Hall B hasn't run any experiments yet, but if you can talk from the previous work they did in Hall B. 
Ah, well, <laughs> okay, well, um, so yeah, so Hall D hasn't taken any data yet, and we, we won't for a little while, um, but uh, the, uh, you know, there have been plenty of experiments, many, many experiments actually run here at Jefferson Lab. I've been involved in a couple of them uh, in one of the other experimental halls, as Steve mentioned. One of them, I guess more recently, it was involved with um, a, a Primex experiment, which is for the, pre looking for um, uh, neutral uh, pion production through <laughs> Primakov effect. But the main thing there is that that one had a, a very fundamental prediction from a theory. And this is what the, kind of the gist of all these experiments are. Is we want to try to have a model or a theory on how these things work at a very low level. And um, we make predictions, and then we try to do experiments that will help prove or disprove that prediction, or at least support that prediction from the theory. And so then as you do these experiments, you start refining the theory. Because sometimes there are var variables that go into the theory that are not very well known. They're kind of coming from other experiments or, or other calculations. And so these get refined over time. So in that particular experiment, um, you know, it was a, a very precise experiment. It was measuring the, um, the neutral decay width of the, uh, the pi zero um, through, uh, through this Primakov effect, and uh, more precisely than it has ever been done before. And it became, it was actually consistent with um, the theory that uh, had predicted it which is actually very good because it allows, it did actually allow the theorists to kind of move forward then on trying to refine it to predict even other things. Um, as far as just generally, you know, the, the type of um, things we do here, and, and you might ask, you know, why do the GLUEX experiment? What is important about it? Um, and, you know, this is basic research, and so it's adding to the basic knowledge of mankind about how things in our world and the universe work. Um, one of the big questions that we actually have in nuclear physics right now is called the question of confinement, which means um, when you have quarks, they can never be alone. They always have to be with other quarks. And the reason for that is the glue that holds them together. If you start trying to pull it apart, you're putting energy in that glue, and eventually that glue pops and breaks. If you think like a rubber band, the ends of the, when it does that, it creates two new quarks, and you're still stuck with quarks connected to quarks. We want to understand the nature of that. Why is that? And you have to do experiments about you know, the glue that holds things together to understand why the, these uh, properties exist. All right, and now we have a question from the Governor's School. Yeah, I was just wondering, I know that Mike Epps talked about how um, the electrons went through about five and a half laps. I was just wondering if that hole was kind of part of those laps, if it went through that magnet and then came back out and went around the laps again. Uh, no, after, once it comes out of the accelerator, it, the beam is out of the accelerator. It kind of goes in a straight line. They stop bending it, and they send it in a straight line to us in the end stations. And it goes through this, and there's actually, on the other side of this thing, in the wall, there's a small pipe that the beam will go into, and it's what we call it the beam dump. And there's a bunch of earth piled up on... This building is actually half underground, and so it really is underground. The beam is still underground at that point, and it gets dumped into the earth, and um, it just uh, dissipates the energy at that point. Uh, we're also wondering how big the detector is. Well, if you can see, I mean, unfortunately, there's a, a guy right over there now. I, uh, if you took out that black part in the middle of the big red magnet, I could stand in there, and it'd be just about, I'd be standing up, and it'd be just about at the top of my head. So it's about a six-foot diameter um, magnet there. Um, and so from that, maybe you get a sense of the scale. Uh, downstream of that, we have another calorimeter that's actually about almost as big as the, the red part here, because as the, um, the photons go out, they'll spread out at, at an angle and uh, downstream, and we want to capture all of those. And uh, when you're running experiments, are you in there watching it, or how does that work? Oh, that's a good question. The, the radiation environment in the hall, just the amp, because when the beam comes in and all these reactions are going taking place, you have lots of high-energy particles flying around everywhere, so there's a high radiation environment down here, and so we cannot be in the hall while the experiment is running. We have to control it from another, remote, another room that's upstairs. We call that the counting house because we're counting how many times certain things happen. Um, they have a very elaborate system. Well, it's kind of elaborate, but a system of double doors that are locked, and uh, the uh, accelerator actually controls that remotely with magnetic locks to allow us in and make sure that we have training for um, you know, radiation. You know, we know how to operate in a radiation environment and uh, oxygen deficiency hazards and things like that. Um, and when you do come in, if the beam is in, if we're in an operation where the beam could go on, everybody gets a key from this little key thing that you put in your pocket, and it's physically impossible for them to turn on the beam as long as you have that key. So it's your, your kind of safety 
um, that to make sure that they can't turn it on while you're in here until you go out and put the key back in. All right. Thanks for, for those great questions. Okay. So um, when I was in school, we, and we're getting a little bit of feedback from someone. I'm not sure where that's coming from, but there we go. Um, I always like doing the experiments. So it's always fun doing the experiments and, at least for me, collecting the data and getting the apparatus to work. Um, what wasn't as fun, at least for me personally, was once you have the data, actually doing something with it, which unfortunately is actually the part, you know, the, the point of doing the experiment. It isn't that fun doing the experiment, is actually learn from it. And um, it would be insane for us to work through this stuff by hand. Even if you have a room full of graduate students and an unlimited supply of pizza, it, it's just not going to happen. So computers, right? You have computers to crunch the numbers for you. And in our computer center, happily, we have Sandy, who's going to tell us all about computers here at the lab. Sandy. So hi everyone. I'm Sandy Philpot, and I'm the Scientific Computing Operations Manager here at Jefferson Lab. It's my job to make sure that all the computers you see in this room are up and running and are available to the scientists to actually analyze the data they took. So I'm standing in a room called the Computing and Data Facility. We're about a half a mile away from the underground accelerator and experimental halls that you saw earlier. We're in an office building on the bottom floor, so we're above ground, but we do have a climate controlled room with locks so that people can't just walk in and start using our computers. We have a raised floor so that we can run tables underneath and all the connections we need. We keep the room full because as you can imagine, a room full of uh, over a thousand computers that we have can get very hot. So how are we connected? David said that they have the counting room where they collect all of their data and they only have a small amount of storage space there. We take all of that data and ship it across the network to the computing facility here where the first thing we do is make sure we store it on tape. It's very, very important that we don't lose any of the data that came off of the accelerator because that's what the scientists use to analyze their experiment. So, we have about 10,000 tapes now. This is just a small tape cartridge. We have about 10,000 of these that are storing data that we've collected since the experiment had started running. Uh, back in the mid-90s. So the first thing that we have to make sure we do is write the data that they've collected onto tape. And it's actually so important that we write it onto two tapes because we can't afford to lose the scientific data. We take one copy and actually remove it from our tape library and store it in a room across the hall. It's fireproof. It's called our tape vault. And that way, we're always sure that we have a copy of all the experimental data that's been taken in the experimental halls by the scientists over the years. So right now, we have 10,000 of these tapes. They're in a robotic tape library. Now, how do we keep track of them all? If you can see, they're barcoded. So if you can see the barcode on here, each tape has its own barcode. The tape robot knows how to go read these barcodes. We keep all the data in a database. So when a physicist asks for their data, we say, ah, that data is on tape number 600076. We go tell the robot to get that tape and stick it into one of 14 tape drives that we have. So first and foremost, save the data. Now, what do we do with all that data? We have over a thousand computers in the room. I'm responsible for making sure they're all up, running, talking to each other on the network. The software is up to date. The old computers go out. The new computers come in. We get what we call a cluster or a group of computers, sometimes once a year, sometimes in uh, funding years where the money's tighter, we don't. So we currently, out of these thousand computers, have eight clusters that have different functionality. The main cluster for the experimental physicists are analyzing data, so the physicists have special software that knows how to look at the events they captured to be able to take a look into that data and see what happened when they ran their experiment. The other clusters 
are actually for our theoretical physicists. So in those clusters, scientists can actually run simulations and help predict or expect what they think might happen and compare the simulated data to the actual data that they collected from the accelerator. One really cool thing about our clusters is that we have our own accelerators. It's not an electron beam accelerator. It's a computing accelerator. And if you look closely, some of you may recognize this for all of you video gamers out there. We actually use graphics cards and the processors inside them which this one's not open, this is an older model because all of our newest models are hard at work doing computation. But the processors inside these graphics cards are really good number crunchers. And just like they crunch numbers for you guys to do your video games, our scientists can write code to program these graphics cards to crunch the numbers they need for their simulations. So we think it's pretty cool that we have our own accelerators. And actually, with our newest cluster this year and our newest graphics cards, we were able to make the cluster look like one big supercomputer. It was actually only 40 machines, each one with four graphics cards. So with that cluster, we were able to make it onto the top 500 supercomputing list. We came in at number 363. So we are probably the cheapest or least expensive cluster on that supercomputing list because we're able to do our calculations on these really fast graphics number crunches. So my background is in computer science. I've been here at Jefferson Lab since before we had this big room full of computers. And over the years, I've watched the halls come online, taken the data, written it to tape, stored it in the tape library and manage these clusters of computers you see in the room to help the physicists uh, analyze and simulate their data to further science. That's it in a nutshell. Great. So um, you mentioned that the, 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 the supercomputer is one of the least expensive supercomputers. How least expensive is it? So to make it onto number 363 out of 500, we did this for much less than a million dollars. That might sound like a lot to you guys, but supercomputers themselves, big machines, can cost tens and hundreds of millions of dollars and more. The key is that our scientists can use each individual machine to do a small job, or, as I said, we can make the cluster act like one big machine, one big supercomputer, and just run a single job. So we have a lot of flexibility in the way that the scientists are able to use these, these calculators to uh, be able to analyze their work. And we were also wondering if you happen to know roughly how many computers you actually have in there. We have over a thousand computers uh, grouped together in uh, seven or eight different clusters depending on how you count them. But each computer has anywhere from one to eight to up to 32 cores right now. So that, plus the graphics processors would have hundreds of cores, give us a lot of compute power in a small amount of space. Now, uh, actually, sorry? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the room is actually uh, outfitted so that we can add more computers, but as it turns out, computers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So the more compute power we have, typically the smaller it gets. Some of our racks aren't even full all the way to the top. So we have plenty of room to expand, but actually computers are getting smaller each time we go out for a new procurement. So when I use my laptop at home, I, I feel the heat on my lap. I notice you're wearing a sweater. If you're <laughs> in there with a thousand computers, shouldn't it be like blazing hot in there? Well, actually, we have to work with our facilities management group here at Jefferson Lab to make sure the room stays cold enough. There's actually chilled water around the site, and some of that chilled water is pumped into this room. You can imagine if I go stand in the back of one of these racks that I'll have to take my sweater off soon because it gets upwards of 80 or 90 degrees behind the racks. And so we align the racks in hot and cold aisles. We force cold air up through the floors 
through tiles that have holes in them, and then the computers get all the cold air, pump it out the back as they compute, and it feeds into air conditioners behind the racks, which then recirculate, make it cold, and keep things flowing. So it's very important that we work with the facilities group to not only keep the room cool, but to make sure we have enough power to run these machines. We consume uh, about a half a megawatt of power when we're running all these. So sometimes even in the summer, we've been asked to please shut our computing down so that people at home can run their air conditioners and, and office space. So we can generate a lot of heat as these jobs run. And Sandy, we received another question from our Google Plus um, page. How long does the typical um, computing task take? Does it take minutes, hours, days? Well, we actually have the scientists break the jobs up so that they can run in a matter of hours or days because there are certainly interruptions to the room, like when we have to shut down the power or cooling. So while it may take months to analyze the data from one experiment, the scientists break it down into manageable jobs that can run for typically eight hours a day, and then they assimilate all the results at the end so that they're not having to make sure the computers stay up for six months at a time to analyze their data with no interruption. And they're very good about breaking their jobs up to be able to do that. Great. Thank you so much. And Thank so you. this so this has been just a cursory overview of how experiments are run here at the lab. Uh, there, in actuality, there's so many other groups and divisions that are involved to um, conduct an experiment. When Steve and I do an experiment for the YouTube channel, it might take five or ten minutes. But in, here at the, at the lab, it can take five to ten years from the time a proposal is approved to the time that results are, are published, just to give you an idea of the scope or the magnitude of the experiments here at the lab. And so we'll have a general question uh, period right now. Again, uh, the schools who are with us, again, if you actually do have a question, please let us know through the group chat on the side. Uh, but we do have a question for Dave, actually. So I'm hoping Dave is still out there can still hear me. Um, you had mentioned, well, Mike had mentioned that our accelerator accelerates electrons. But in your hall, you get photons. So how does an electron accelerator that accelerates electrons shoot photons into your hall. Uh, I'm glad you asked that. There may be some background noise because there's a lot of work going in the hall here, but hopefully you can still hear me. Um, actually, there's about uh, 80 meters upstream, we ha will have a uh, thing called our photon tagger. And there we have a very thin diamond. And if you pass a charged particle through material, as it comes close to a nucleus, there's a chance that it can do a thing called bremsstrahlung, which is, stands, means breaking radiation. It's a German word. And it, that means it can emit a photon. And uh, then the electron is left with a little less energy, and the photon goes basically straight forward. We use a, uh, a diamond, a thin diamond, because then we can do a thing called coherent bremsstrahlung, which gives a little enhancement in the energy. Uh, unfortunately, this bremsstrahlung mechanism will create a lot of low-energy photons and very few high-energy photons. We really want just the high energy photons. So by having it as a, a diamond crystal instead of just some uh, you know, plain material, then um, we can get this enhancement in the energy, which we have it set up on a, a very sensitive uh, tuning mechanism, which just turns the angle. And you turn that angle relative to the beam coming in, the electron beam coming in, and you'll adjust where the energy peak is. That's why it's so far away, actually, because then the, the guys that are really high energy go straight down the beam line, and the guys that maybe less energy, energetic photons, will go wider, and we have a, um, a, uh, a what we call a collimator, which is a big block of lead with a small hole in it. It <laughs> blocks everything except for what's going down the middle. So basically, just pass it through some material, and you can create a photon that way. Very good. Uh, we also have a question uh, for Sandy coming from Hill House. Okay. Pass away. They're approaching the camera now. Go ahead. Go ahead, Hill House. Um, my dad's a software engineer and he works for at and and I just want you to know that I know sometimes when you uh, you have to transfer the data from one computer to another, how do you do that exactly? Ah, okay. So I work with a lot of software engineers and developers and 
we all make sure that our computers can talk to each other over our high-speed network. We have both Ethernet, which is like the kind of uh, connection that you have maybe in your classroom or at the library, but we also have a very high-speed connection called InfiniBand. And all of our data is stored on a central file server called Luster, and all of our computers can see the Luster file system and all those files via this fast InfiniBand network. So, for instance, when the hall takes the data, writes it up into the counting room, we can copy it across the network using just standard copy commands. We don't have to encrypt it. We can just copy the data and move it across at very high speed. The connection between here and the counting house is 10 gigabits per second over this Ethernet fiber. And within this room here, we have uh, connections up to 40 and 56 gigabit per second. So we're able to move data around quickly by using standard um, Linux or Unix uh, copy commands. And we have another question from the Governor's School. Great. Um, my question is, what kind of experiments have you guys done in the past? And we'll give that to Dave. So what kind of experiments were done in the past, Dave? Um, well, let's say we've got a, a number of them that have been done here. I mentioned the, the Primex experiment where we were measuring the, uh, the neutral uh, uh, decay lifetime of the Pi Zero. Um, also, let's see, try to think of other things that have been done in... Um, we have this uh, Q-weak experiment, which I guess is looking for the weak charge uh, in the nucleon. Um, so, and um, we also have a, uh, an add-on. Oh, another experiment that's been approved for Hall D has not run yet is this one to measure the uh, uh, polarizability, electric magnetic polarizabilities of the um, uh, charged pion. So um, all of these tend to be ones that are looking at properties of nucleons or mesons that have to do with how the um, these things are connected together. What the and that's the strong force in nature. There are actually we say four, three or four fundamental forces, depending on whether you count electric and uh, weak force together. But the strong force is the, the color force or strong force is by far the, the most uh, strongest of, of all the forces, much stronger than the electric force or electromagnetic force. And that's the one that holds the protons and neutrons together. So we really are focused on experiments that study um, excitation levels or um, uh, other properties of that glue that holds things together. Very good. Um, we have a question coming from the YouTube feed um, asking how our accelerator and detector compare to the uh, LHC. So I'm hoping that Mike knows that information. And you're on mute again, so yes. Hi, Steve. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can. So they were wondering how the uh, accelerator at CERN compares to the accelerator here. So the accelerator at CERN, uh, the LHC is a large hadron collider. So they use different particles, right? Hadrons versus electrons here. And it's a collider where you take two beams that are both moving and you, you smash them together and you have your detectors in that location to look at a shower of particles that will come out. This is a fixed target uh, linear accelerator, even though we're a racetrack shape, right? We're linear because we do all of our acceleration in the straight part. So our Nuclear physics targets are fixed. They don't move. The electron beam is the thing that we accelerate, and it comes uh, comes in and hits the target in a fixed location, as opposed to two beams coming together. And as far as size, we're actually uh, a much smaller accelerator, right? The uh, the LHC, That's correct. Their, their track is about 27 kilometers around. Ours is about one and a half kilometers around. Uh, the energy is also much much higher at the LHC. Uh, they get up to about 4 TeV, where we That's are right. around 12 GeV once our upgrade is complete. And we are um, in, they're also we are much in deeper. energy nuclear physics facility. That's correct. They, right. they do high energy physics at the LHC. And Sandy, we have a question to you from YouTube. Uh, what are the capacity of your tapes? The tapes? So these are our newest, and they're going to hold 2.5 terabytes. We don't have those in production yet. Most of the ones we're using now hold about a terabyte of data. So if you guys remember your bits and bytes, a bit is the very smallest piece of information, a yes or a no, a one or a zero. 
when you put those together in groups of eight, that's a byte. A thousand bytes are a kilobyte. A thousand kilobytes are a megabyte. A thousand megabytes are a gigabyte. A thousand gigabytes are a terabyte. And that's what one of the tapes that we use now will hold. And these are going to hold over twice that much. So we have about 10 petabytes worth of data. A thousand terabytes is a petabyte. And we have about 10 petabytes stored on these 10,000 tapes. That's Great. a lot of bytes. <laughs> That's a lot of bytes. And now we're, bytes. we're heading over to Hill House. You guys have a question? Sure, just ask a question. Uh, my question is, why do the particles decay so fast? Okay, so I think, yeah, Dave had mentioned that the, uh, the particles decay very quickly. That there are, you'll have your mesons. Why, the question is, why do they decay so quickly? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I mean, it's really just that is the scale at which um, things that are decaying through the strong force decay. If you had things that are electromagnetically decay, so particles can decay through these different forces of nature. If it decays strongly, then it's about 10 to the minus 20 seconds. If it decays electromagnetically, then it's about 10 to the minus 16 seconds. Um, and uh, things that are just weak decays will decay, even have longer decay times. So um, it's just a, a, um, a, the nature of the universe, I guess, is the real answer. Mm -hmm. And we're going back to the governor's school for another question from them. Um, I know that David Lawrence was talking about quarks and mesons earlier. I've never heard of a meson, but I've heard of quarks and leptons. Really, what's the difference between a, a meson and a lepton? All right, so there are, there are really two categories of fundamental particles. Leptons, which the electrons belong to that family, um, are one group, and there's six of those. That also includes neutrinos. There's um, electrons, muons, and taus, and they're associated neutrinos, the electron neutrino, muon neutrino, tau neutrino. And the other family are quarks, where we have the up, down, strange, charm, top, bottom quarks. Um, the quarks can combine together into these structures that are, um, in fact, they have to combine together in these structures. And they can, the type of structures have to be, um, well, without getting too much detail, they have to be these colorless structures, but you can combine them into a quark and an anti-quark together to become a meson. So if there's really two quarks, it's a meson. If there are three, then it's a baryon. And, and three quark structures are like protons and neutrons. Great. Um, we have one more, it's actually one question for all three people, uh, wondering uh, what your educational background is to do the job that you're doing. And since we're on Dave right now, we'll, we'll stick with Dave. Yeah, um, well, I went, uh, I'd say I grew up in Oklahoma, went to public school, and then I went to uh, University of Oklahoma for four years to get my uh, Bachelor of Physics, then Arizona State University for about six years to get my Ph.D., and then I went and did a postdoc uh, position. And there I stayed a little longer than usual, about six years before I got hired on as a staff member here at, at JLab. And now we'll uh, ask uh, Mike the same question. Uh, so I grew up in Norfolk, Virginia. I also went to public school. Uh, I went to Norfolk State University where I got my degree in, my undergraduate degree in physics. Uh, I spent about six years in the Marine Corps. Uh, after that, I went to graduate school at Hampton University. Uh, and then I came to work at the accelerator here. I spent about 12 years working in accelerator operations. And I've spent the last four and a half years with the Department of Energy. And the Sandy. I also grew up in Norfolk and went to public school. I left there and went to Virginia Tech. I'm a Hokie. And I got a Bachelor of Science degree in computer science. I first started working in the area at Newport News Shipbuilding in their telecommunications department. And I kept hearing about this really cool place up the road that they were building, and it was called Sea Bath. And I thought, what is that? And after quite a long time, I've been here uh, most, I, I've been here half of my life now, actually. Great. Now we're going to go over to Hill House, where we have a question. Okay. <laughs> Okay, my question, David. My question is for David, and I wanted to know why do you want high energy protons instead of low energy protons? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Well, the the fact is that um, certain reactions won't happen. You, you need we actually need the more energetic accelerator even to create these exotic hybrid mesons we're trying to look for in Hall D, which is why Hall D was kind of motivated or helped strongly motivate the upgrade of this accelerator to double its energy. If you don't have enough energy, then you just don't have enough to create the, the particle. You guys may have heard of this uh, famous Einstein equation, E equals mc squared. The E is energy and the M is mass, and the mass of the particle then dictates how much energy you need in order to create it because it's being created just out of the energy that's in the photon when it comes in and interacts with this proton, which is essentially sitting still in the target. The proton's basically just sitting there waiting for something to happen. So higher energy photons will allow you to create certain things and look at different things. You know, the, the question actually came up earlier about how are we different from LHC. It's really kind of a, a, a matter of what type of microscope you have, what is the, the focus or the focal length of that microscope. Somebody looking at a microscope, it's a very similar device as looking at a telescope in space, but they are very different ranges or, or scales of the things you're trying to look at. And in order to look at the things at the scale that we want, we need uh, photons of this energy. And okay, we're going to take one final question from the governor's school. Go Hogies. But um, <laughs> just wanted to ask, do y'all by chance have a picture of, or a computer picture of what exactly is happening? during all of these things exactly? I just would like to see an image of possibly you think. So. Who wants that one? Oh, my name's Luke. My name's Luke. Sorry. Who wants that one? Go ahead. Oh. Well, I was just going to say, okay, so we, we, you can't actually see it like um, the, the particles are so small and because of the nature of how they, um, they interact with things, we can't really see them with a, like a photograph. What we do is we do a lot of simulations and we render pictures kind of of what's happening uh, in there. The, the, the whole point of the detectors is to try to give us um, some detection ability of these tiny little particles which don't interact very much um, along the way. You, don't, you actually, the more you interact with them, the more you change their properties. So you try to build a detector that's actually very thin and doesn't allow them to react much. And you reconstruct or redraw the picture based on that little bit of information you get from them as they pass through your detector on their way out. So, um, so that it's not really possible to take a, a picture of the, the actual small interaction taking place. We can only draw those kind of with uh, CGI or something. All right. So those have been some really great questions. Thank you. Um, and if you have any additional questions or if you think of some later, uh, this video is going to be posted on our YouTube page where you can post any comments or ask any additional questions. Before we sign out, a few housekeeping items. Um, this was a virtual field trip, but you can come here for real and actually walk around our accelerator. You can't do it like on the drop of a hat, but we do uh, roughly every two years have an open house. The next one we hope will be in spring of 2014. Uh, check our various uh, social media outlets uh, to see announcements about that. Um, don't forget YouTube. Right? Watch us on Frostbite Theater, then you'll again begin to believe that Jefferson Lab is just a place we fill with the nitrogen around, but even though now you've learned it's far more than that. Um, be on the lookout also for other hangouts from other de uh, Department of Energy labs. We're just one of the labs in the Department of Energy complex, and there are plans for other hangouts of the labs. Uh, we're more of a single purpose lab. Other labs do a multitude of things, so you can learn lots more uh, in addition to what we've learned here at those labs. Uh, again, be on the lookout for announcements for that. I'd like to thank our schools for participating today. Thank you for the James Hill House and the Governor's School of Southside Virginia for taking time out of your schedule to join us. Give yourselves a hand. Thank you. I'd like to thank Mike, Dave, and Sandy for taking time out of their work day and coming here early to do, uh, to do the same. Let's give them a hand. I'd like to thank also the folks behind the scenes. We also we have people roaming around here, make sure our lights don't turn off by accident and feeling us uh, the or, uh, looking for the questions that come online. And uh, thank you to everyone who is watching us online uh, for making this a, a very fun event for us to do. Yes, thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.